Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Marjorie Egan, Jim Browdy, live at the library. Streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Governor Healy will join us in about 25 minutes in person to take your questions and ours. The Attorney General will join us on October 6th at the library. I just want to mention another uh, segment I'm really looking forward to. I know Marjorie is too. Uh, Larry Tribe and Nancy Gertner, uh, former federal judge Gertner, and obviously arguably the most important constitutional law scholar in America, Professor Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Larry Tribe will join us together on October 2nd to sort through the uh, former president's legal uh, travails. We're joined now by Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Uh, he is the UMass Boston Chancellor and who's just kind enough to uh, give us a book he wrote in 2019, Humanitarianism and Mass Migration Confronting the World Crisis. We thank you for that and we thank you for being here. Thanks thank so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Chancellor, tell us um, the f about affirmative action at your school. I mean, this is going to is, how are you going to handle this? What's it going to mean? Jeff, so first, uh, thank you. Thank you for, <laughs> for having me. It's such a pleasure. Uh, look, um, we are the most diverse campus in New England. We are the third most diverse campus in the United States. So for us, moving forward, two things are true. Uh, we will align with the law and um, uh, work within the framework of the Supreme Court decision. At the same time, we firmly, emphatically believe that in the current age, in the age of super diversity, uh, our ability to educate all um, our extraordinarily diverse students the vast majority of whom originate here in the city of Boston, um, will continue to be a top priority. This is who we are, it's in our DNA. We are firm believers that diversity and excellence are two sides of the same uh, coin. Um, look, it's a very unfortunate um, decision. Uh, I was a dean at UCLA for about a decade. Uh, the University of California lived yes. with what the Roberts courts just nationalized for a quarter of a century. And I was at the forefront uh, as a dean of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA in engineering the vehicles to make sure that the university is able to attract and, and retain and, and graduate a diverse population that reflects our population. So what we've learned from that experience is um, it was an enormous endeavor. Uh, it was a very important endeavor. And at the end, um, we designed a model that I think became a model for the country. And that is creating networks of university-assisted K-12 schools to create the, the pathways for our minoritized students to be able to have access uh, to the uh, incredible opportunities that our public research universities in our country uh, afford. But you were doing that before the Roberts Court, which does not share your view that diversity and excellence are two sides of the same coin. Uh, before that, why are you confident, if you are confident, that that sort of approach to doing what Supreme Court tried to kill will pass constitutional muster? Um, so, the findings, as I understand them, um, and the direction of the, of the court, um, leaves sufficient room for colleges and universities to really delve into um, the, the background, mm -hmm. uh, the histories, um, just swimming against uh, the undertow that comes with living in segregated cities, uh, with segregated schooling. So um, I, I, I think that the California experience suggests that these pipelines, while very, very 
costly, offer a pathway that will survive constitutional scrutiny. You know, let's stay on this for a couple of minutes. We've discussed a lot of the whole notion of getting rid of legacy admissions, and obviously there's litigation pending against Harvard before the Federal Education Department where they're doing an investigation. There's a piece in the uh, Washington Post about Johns Hopkins and how they, I didn't even know they had, quietly was the word they used in the story, eliminated legacy admissions in 2014, and their white population has gone down dramatically. Their population among students of color has gone up dramatically. The one hole in this story to me is, oh, by the way, uh, a graduate, Mike Bloomberg, gave us $2 billion <laughs> to spend on financial aid. Yeah. Most schools aren't getting a $2 billion grant from uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg to do this. So it seems to me that there is practically an obligation on every school, including Harvard, that's about to get a new president in a week, or maybe even less than a week. Friday. Friday is it Friday of this week, Claudine Gay, that uh, our view, uh, as presumptuous as it sounds, the first thing she should announce is we're ending legacy admissions here at Harvard, and we'd urge our fellow universities and colleges to do the same thing. Is there any argument for preserving legacy admissions which overwhelmingly benefit white families and their white kids. Any argument to maintain them? Yeah. Um, no. Okay. Well, then I'm going to play for you. I want to play for you. The former president of Harvard, Drew Gilpin Faust, put out a terrific book about her childhood. She was with us maybe two weeks ago. We asked her the question about uh, legacy. I assume she'd be against them. And I, was, I said, why didn't you eliminate them? Here's what she said. I think legacy admissions has positive dimensions. It does build community. It brings people across generations to create support for Harvard and, and defend Harvard. I, I think it's also important to recognize there's all this criticism about legacy admissions, but legacy admissions is not going to substitute for affirmative action. Mm -hmm. It's an issue, but it's a, almost a, a diversion from the big problem, which is, you know, how do we have equitable access? What do you say to her? Yeah, I'm, I'm persuaded that the best way to keep and build a community and the best way to defend a university is through legacy admissions. Look, our country is undergoing an extraordinary demogra demographic transition. We have a rapidly aging population below replacement fertility rates. The only sector of the population now growing are kids growing up in families of color. This is the future. For us in Boston, it's our history. We became the city we are because of the various waves of immigration. And it is the future when the only sector of the population growing are kids growing up in kids of color, growing up in immigrant origin families. I think that there are multiple claims that can be made about ways of creating community that are more aligned with the future of our city, the future of our commonwealth, than imagining some uh, pastoral past when uh, defending community was so existential. You said immigrant origin uh, community. Immigrant origin meaning, I think, at least one parent was born outside this country, right? Correct. And that is the fastest growing segment, from what I understand, immigrant origin kids, the fastest growing grow segment of college admissions at a time when college admissions are on the decline. Is that not true? That is, cru that is exactly true. We just published that a P a in the in the Globe. Precisely. Oh, your thing, right? This yes. topic. That's where someone, I heard it. I knew I heard yeah. it from somebody. With someone with the same last name. Would that someone Oops. be your So that's my spouse? wife, yeah. yes, of 48 years. Okay. My wife of 48 well, years. Well, thank her for us, too. <laughs> well, you know... It's, Who it's, teaches across the river, by the way, at that know, place. We know that. Uh, so you, you, you did write this piece with your wife about uh, the headline, which is Immigrant Origin Youth, Fastest Growing Group of Students in Higher Education. But I'm wondering why, because I'm reading more and more now about how lots of Americans... You UMass is, is cheaper than some of these most mm. expensive schools, but still are, are rethinking the old mantra that you've got to go to college, you've got to get a college education. So what are these uh, kids of immigrant origin seeing that other students aren't because they seem to be bucking a trend that's going in the other direction? Yeah, so I think that um, it's about realizing the sacrifices, enormous, almost biblical, that their parents make 
yeah. to come to this country. So the second generation, the generation of the children of immigrants, uh, really uh, see their journey in basic ways as realizing many of the ambitions yeah. that their parents couldn't, couldn't realize because they had, to, they had to work. And that's the history of the Commonwealth. The history of the Commonwealth is a history of waves of migrants, voluntary, involuntary, other than our native peoples, everybody else came in through immigration, voluntary, involuntary. Um, so there is a, a, um, an attachment to the idea that education is such a huge um, door opener for a better future. For the better future, their parents came to the United States to realize. So the connectivity with education is very, very uh, profound in our immigrant origin students. I, I talk to our students every day, and there is a common narrative. And the narrative is, I need to do better to give back yeah. to my parents, to my community. This is very ancient as an idea in the field of immigration. Well, you know, I, I, I was reading the story last night in anticipation of your being here, as I was also reading other stories online about this huge influx now of people coming across the border. And you think what these people yeah. go through to get here, going through this tropical forest where children are seeing other you know, bodies of people who didn't make it and people who get, uh, you know, the, the, the smugglers and the atrocities. You think the kind of person that can do that, can make it through that, is an extraordinary person, especially someone who's got their children yeah. uh, by the hand or in their arms. Yeah. These are extraordinary yeah. people. Yeah. And yeah. I guess that's why the second generation does right. often so well. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. You are cheaper. Tell us how much cheaper you are. <laughs> um, look, UMass Boston is uh, the only public research university in the city, and uh, we offer a price point that is extraordinarily competitive, given the quality of the faculty, given the quality of the opportunities we have for, um, for our students in terms of internships, in terms of connectivity after they graduate with the labor market. So, uh, at a time when higher education is in an arms race, where costs are now in an unsustainable pathway in terms of just the lack of affordability, and that's part of the algorithm that goes into, Marjorie, what you referred to earlier, which is a lot of folk are losing yeah. the idea that higher education is the pathway to a better tomorrow, in part because the math doesn't work, especially if you're in the, in the lower quartile of the, of the income uh, distribution. Education continues to generate just enormous, enormous rewards um, in, in, for the middle class uh, and above, less so for the working class populations. And we serve immigrant origin students, we serve Vets, we sell, serve, um, you know, second chance students, uh, working working class students. Most of our students work, uh, so I think that that's part of the magic of UMass Boston. Yeah. It's not only our spectacular campus. I'll invite it's you to come. Oh, oh, oh yeah, but I have to, I have to bring you back to show you our, our new quad. Do we yeah. get a free meal? You get a. <laughs> You get oh, a no. you okay, get the fine. Chancellor's uh, sandwich special, which oh, yeah? is the, the chimichurri uh, oh, sandwich. Oh, okay. You get you you'll get. Uh, I'll get well, you tell that. Tell people. I mean, you're, by the way, we should glass. say this is the Chancellor of UMass Boston, yes. uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco. I'm but just sorry. to explain to people who haven't been out to Columbia Point, I mean, you got all that glass. You're looking out the ocean. I mean, it is a spectacular. That's a that's a million dollar view, is it not? That is the best view in the city of Boston. Yeah. Uh, the views from the dorms um, where our students live are breathtaking. Yeah, they really are. By the they way, really I should are. say, I mentioned this when I met you last time you were on, my older kid 
spent her freshman year at UMass Boston. The only reason she left for Smith's because she wanted to move away from me. But I, no, I'm serious. She That's loved right. every single minute of it and talks about it to this day. You know, I want to talk about one of the, you appear to me, I don't know you that well, I just know of you for the most part, a Chancellor. You seem to be a pretty hopeful character. And I have to say, I'm always looking for some little slice of something to give me ho hope. And Marjorie and I were talking about immigration in general the other day, about the, the in total inability of Congress to deal with anything, particularly at comprehensive immigration reform. Right in the middle of the discussion, this court decision came down saying that the DACA program, the so-called DREAMers, kids brought here by their parents, very young, born in another country, obviously not voluntarily by them, they were infants or were very young, was declared illegal by a judge. He didn't end the program that started by Obama, I think about 11 years, I think 11 years ago. But it seems to me, I hate the expression low-hanging fruit, but I'm gonna use it anyway. If there was ever low-hanging fruit for bipartisanship in a world where there are not enough workers in particular, it would seem to be uh, uh, Congress embracing the DACA program, the Dreamer program, would be it. Uh, uh, does that not suggest to you that any hope of serious immigration reform in our lifetime is virtually impossible? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was um, Antonio Gramsci who said, um, I'm pessimistic by intellect, but optimistic by will. Mm. Today, facing the challenges we face, you have to have optimism, especially in my field, in the field of, of education. Mm. Um, I think it's extremely unfortunate. Uh, as you've noted, these are folk, youth, who through no agency of their own find themselves in the shadow, in the shadow of, uh, of the law. And by the way, they're exactly like the kid of these legislators who oppose it. They sat next to the school with them, they played sports with them, they grew up in the exact same environment, exactly. they just happened to exactly. have been born in another country. Exactly, and many of these kids, we did the largest survey of its kind, of, uh, undocumented youth in higher education, many of these kids don't know that they don't have papers. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is a real missed opportunity. Uh, this is something that is both the smart thing to do, we invested in educating these kids through K-12. The, the, the transition to college, the transition to the labor market is what is so significant. And affording them that opportunity, the opportunity to give up. In our survey, we discovered most of this uh, young folk go into the service professions. Is that so? uh, during COVID, I did an op-ed, more, there are more um, undocumented folk working as first responders during COVID than there are nurses in all of Austria. Mm. Wow. So this is a huge missed opportunity. Um, it's not smart and it's not ethical to, again, folk that through no action, or not agency of their own, find themselves in this very, very severe undertow, threatening to drown their dreams. Yeah, and people, I mean, we're adding to, to DACA, I mean, people that have not lived in another country since they were two years old, and now they're 35 or 40, they're going to go back. Many of them don't have family, yeah. don't have any connection. <laughs> or even speak the language exactly. sufficiently. I well, mean, they're as American insane. as any kid exactly. born in this country. Exactly. Well, if you country. came here at two years old, exactly. yeah, you are, right? So when do we have this lunch? <laughs> Let's do the show at Columbia Point. That's what By we the way, do. we would so, do that in a second. If you speak to Jamie and our colleagues. Jamie, we're let's make gorgeous. it work. I don't mean while we're on the air. I'll give you the million Jamie. dollar I mean, view. Exactly. <laughs> Chancellor, it is a, it is a pleasure to see you as Thank always. You. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so and, much. And the Thank buildings you. over there are just, just gorgeous. Okay, thank you uh, very much for being with us.